Today on Blue 58, the Packers have added a receiver and brought back a running back since we last talked, but today we're talking about how they could still use more of both. We've already spoken about receivers in the draft, but what about running backs? I think there are some good options available. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink, happy to be with you here for another episode. Got a lot to cover today. We're going to talk about Devin Funches, we're going to talk about Tyler Irvin, going to talk about running back prospects coming up in the draft and we're going to talk through the first chapter of take your eye off the ball 2.0 our book for the blue 58 book club so let's get started first Devin Funches the Packers make a move at wide receiver it's not the move that I would have preferred or expected but they have added a receiver in Devin Funches and he's kind of sticking with the uh, the Brian Gutekunst type here boy Brian Gutekunst has a type he likes his receivers big he likes them pretty muscly and he likes them maybe a little bit slower than uh, the rest of us would prefer uh, Devin Funches big bodied receiver only played the single game with the Colts last year after starting his career with the Carolina Panthers collarbone injury wipes him out for all of 2019 now, the reason we don't have contract numbers yet on Funches is uh, they can't do physicals. So, in theory, the Packers have signed him. That may still get scuttled. I don't expect that to be a, a huge deal. Collarbone issues, while they can be serious, as we well know in Green Bay, um, don't necessarily linger from season to season, though they can. I wouldn't expect that to be a big issue here, but you never know. As a player... It seems like Funches is the guy who has had all the potential in the world, but never really an opportunity to harness it all or put it all together. Everybody knows the passing game in Carolina left a little bit to be desired with Cam Newton at times. That's not to say it wasn't good all the time, but he sometimes lack opportunities that you get with a more conventional quarterback. Uh, and I say that as probably a, a fairly big Cam Newton fan. Funches did seem to have his numbers uh, pressed down a little bit by that, but he still made made a fair amount of big plays. We, you know we track explosive plays, the power sweep. That's something that, that we, we keep an eye on. Uh, for receivers, that's catches of 16 yards or more. Uh, from 2017 to 2018, his last two full seasons in the NFL, Funches uh, produced 37 of those explosive plays. Compared to Packers receivers, that's better than everybody other than Devontae Adams. Over the past two years, so 18 and 19, different time span, I understand, but that's that's all we've got. The last two full seasons for the Packers, only Devontae Adams and Aaron Jones have produced more than 37 explosive plays. If Funches can keep doing that, he's probably a fairly good option. I'm not against him, per se, as just a player. In a vacuum, I think you want guys that can do the things he can do on your team. You know, I'm for big, fast, strong receivers as well. Though Funches' time speed and his play speed are probably a little bit different. Time speed is not good. I would, just looking at a cursory look of what he does on the field, he plays faster than 4-7. Maybe not a lot faster all the time, but he does play faster. Um, you, you like guys like that. The Packers have a lot of them for a reason. Alan Lazard is a good example. Funches seems like just a more probably developed Alan Lazard. So from the standpoint of just having better receivers or more good receivers around, I guess it's not a terrible move. But I would like to see more of a, a speed-oriented guy. and Maybe that comes in the draft. Last time we talked, I think I talked about big swings at the receiver position. Maybe it was a couple episodes ago. Funches doesn't seem like that. He seems like a... Like you're swinging for a double or something like that. There does seem to be a fairly high ceiling here. The floor is also pretty low. Good guy to have around, I think, just generally speaking, but I don't think this is really the top-end addition the Packers receiving core needs. I still would like to see them take at least one, preferably multiple receivers. I would push back on a characterization of this as uh, as similar to the Christian Kirksey or, or Rick Wagner signings, too. I talked about both of those being like pressure reliever signings. You, you, you sign Christian Kirksey, now you don't necessarily have to take a linebacker at 30. You sign Rick Wagner, now you don't necessarily have to take one at 30, uh, you know, a tackle at 30. I don't think this is that 
for the receiver position. I don't think that having Funchess on your roster means that you don't have to go out and continue to add talent in the draft. Better to have him than not, I think, doesn't fix any of your big problems and doesn't diversify your receiving core like I've like I've been asking the Packers to do. And again, that is just my my take on their receiver position. Maybe Brian Goodkins thinks they're just fine, and he seems to, um, just looking at things. Moving on, the Packers also have made a move since we last spoke. In fact, just this morning, news broke that Tyler Irvin will be back in Green Bay one year, just over a million dollar deal. And due to the veteran exception, however, that works out in the new collective bargaining agreement, he'll count just under $900,000 against the cap. That's a pretty good bargain, I think, for a third running back who can also return kicks and punts for you. I think I'm starting to view Irvin's special teams abilities more as a bonus than the primary attraction here. I really like what he could potentially do for the Packers on offense. In some limited reps last year, he did some pretty good things and at least allowed them to add in another element to their attack, a receiving back who could run jet sweeps and just add a little bit of speed to their attack, something that I think they need more of. And if they get that by having two backs on the field instead of necessarily a slot receiver or something like that, I think that accomplishes the same goal. I don't know if this precludes them from taking a running back in the draft, but it does give them a nice fallback option and won't be expensive or ruin their cap even if things don't necessarily go well. So probably a pretty good move. And I know I've gone back and forth on Irvin throughout the course of this offseason. Bring him back, don't bring him back, whatever. I think ultimately looking back on my own viewpoint, what that tells me is it doesn't really matter. Um, if, If you can't come to a conclusion on a guy who's not going to be a starter, I think you probably just sign him and and see what happens. And that seems like what they're doing here. They're not spending a whole lot of money on him. And uh, even if things don't work out, you can just move on. Not a whole lot of damage done. So good to see him back. uh, Diversifies their attack on offense a little bit. And it gives them a fallback option at at running back, at their third running back spot um, this year, if Dexter Williams continues to be Dexter Williams. But... Like I said, I don't think this precludes them from taking a running back in the draft. So let's talk about some guys who could be available in the draft this year, who will be available in the draft this year. In fact, you could draft any one of these guys, uh, provided that you are in the right position to do so. Any one of the guys that we talk about is, in fact, draftable. Running back prospects, I think, are uniquely challenging to evaluate. And I feel like I've said that about every position now, but I think it's true of running backs uh, for the reasons I'm about to outline. For starters, Uh, College production, I think more than any other position, can be a bit of a mirage. I think you get away with being just a great athlete who they hand the ball to and get out of the way at running back in college way more than you do in the pros. And that's true of a couple other positions too. Running back and edge rusher come to mind. But I think just as a pure athleticism position, running back is it in college football. If you are an overwhelming athlete who plays running back, they will figure out ways to get you the ball and have you produce big numbers. The flip side of that is that you will have guys who are not that productive just because they didn't get a lot of opportunities, but can still do useful things for a pro team. So guys that are gadget guys in college, guys who don't really have a defined position but end up in running back in the NFL just because of where they are in terms of height and weight and their overall size and athleticism. They just end up at running back and you, well, you end up with a Tyler Irvin type player. A guy who plays a little bit of special teams, does some interesting stuff on offense, but doesn't necessarily have the defined sort of regular running back skill set. It also seems like running back, more than almost any other position, will have guys who come out of nowhere two years after they're drafted and just rush for 1,200 yards or something like that, or they show up in some random playoff run and it's got like, wow, this guy's good now. He's going to run for 150 yards in the wild card round, another 120 in the divisional round, and, and now he's on the short list to be the Super Bowl MVP. And whenever that happens, you get like 35 articles from various football knowers scattered all over the country saying, well, how did we miss on this guy? What was everyone missing on running back prospect X, that now he's just showing up out of nowhere and he's good. Well, it almost invariably is the case that it's a guy who rushed for like 700 yards in college and tested at the combine like he decided to carry around a backpack with his bowling ball collection in it. It's it's never guys that were just like regular 1,200-yard 
college rushers for three years in a row and ran a 4-3 at the Combine. You get that wide of a variance. You get guys who were not that great in college who turn out to be great in the pros. You get guys that were great in the pros that for whatever reason, or great in college that turn out to not be that great in the pros. So how do you sort through that? Short answer is there's not a great way. The long answer is I think we can find some guys that are both athletic and productive in college and do some things that kind of protect them against being phased out in the NFL. So we find that by looking for guys who are athletic, so relative athletic score again, our old number coming back, guys who move their mass well, so that's thickly built running backs who still run fast. It's going to be speed score. We've talked about that before. Guys who score a lot. Uh, It turns out that touchdowns per game and rushing touchdowns per game both have a fairly strong correlation to being productive as a pro. Got to say that with a little bit of a caveat because it's not necessarily that strong, but compared to how these other metrics translate, how some other statistical things translate, it has a fairly, fairly strong correlation. And then just guys who can catch, I'm looking at some of the top receiving backs in this class too. So I, I set up all those numbers, ran guys who tested at the combine through it and came up with a class of guys based on players who had a relative athletic score of over eight, a speed score of 100 plus uh, that were the top 15 in the class in rushing touchdowns per game and just touchdowns per game and had 50 plus catches. Only two of the guys at the combine hit 50 catches plus all the other numbers as well. So that's not going to be a primary qualifier for us. We'll expand out the 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 criteria just to take... Um, take into consideration the other numbers, but we end up with five guys here to take a look at. Starting with Jonathan Taylor out of Wisconsin. He is Dane Brugler's number three running back, ESPN's number three rated back, and Pro Football Focus's number three rated running back coming out this year. 5'10", 226 pounds, big, strong dude, kind of just a stereotypical Wisconsin back. And if you look at him, from that perspective, being kind of a stereotypical kind of Wisconsin back, though probably faster than what guys are uh, generally stereotyped as being in Wisconsin, it seems like he could be the best pure running back prospect in the draft. The guy that is what people think of when they think of a classic running back. He moves really well for his size. He's productive, had a lot of carries at Wisconsin, and we'll talk about that in a second. But you like him because he is what he says on what it says on the box. You go to the store for draft prospects. You go to the running back section section, and you pick up the box that says one classic running back. You open it up, and Jonathan uh, Taylor is inside. I always stumble over his name because I want to say Jonathan Taylor Thomas, but that's both dating myself and a, a weird thing to think, I suppose. Um, but Jonathan Taylor is that sort of classic running back guy. If I had to find a couple red flags, it would be these. First, he wasn't used as a receiver a lot. That is not necessarily his fault, and he still did have a fair number of catches. But if you're looking for guys that have shown that they can be competent, regular receivers in your offense, he hasn't necessarily done that a lot. He has done it, just not a lot. And again, that's not necessarily his fault. You can only run the plays that are called for you. He also had almost a 1,000 touches in college. That is a lot of mileage on your odometer coming into the NFL. In fact, that was the most of any running back who tested at the Combine this year. He had 968 touches at Wisconsin. The next closest back in, in the Combine class had 866. So that's a bit of a red flag there. That running back was A.J. Dillon out of Boston College. The biggest of the backs that we are looking at today. Six feet tall, 247 pounds. He is top 10 for both Dane Brugler and ESPN. Ninth and seventh, respectively, in those two two, uh, rankings. He is the big version of the classic running back, and he is big at 247 pounds. Productive, consistent at Boston College, ran almost as much as, as Jonathan Taylor. He had 866 touches, but he is even less of a receiver than Taylor was. Does not have a lot in the way of catches in college. So if you're looking for that, this is not your guy. We do get into that a little bit more with Cam Akers out of Florida State. He's five foot, five foot 10, 217 pounds, Fifth ranked running back for ESPN. He's pro football focus is number six. Brugler does not have him in his top 10. 
this seems to be the guy that hits most of what I want out of a running back. He's big, but he's not too big, but big enough to not get necessarily overwhelmed by the physical contact. Fast, but not only fast. He contributes as a receiver. He's got a background as a dual threat quarterback. The drawback here is that he doesn't necessarily produce a lot of big plays, at least not the number that you would expect out of a guy with the athleticism that he has. But if you're looking for a a player that projects to, I think, what the Packers have started to tend a little bit more towards in their running backs, he seems like that kind of guy. He's not the bigger body Devontae Mays, Jamal Williams type. He's more along the line uh, of Aaron Jones, but a little bit more thickly built. For a guy who's even more in the Aaron Jones mold, look at Darrington Evans out of Appalachian State. Appalachian State, excuse me, if you're looking for the local pronunciation. Five foot ten, two hundred three pounds. He has ESPN's number thirty two running back out of thirty three. So take this one with a grain of salt because a lot of the a lot of the tape watchers are not really loving Darrington Evans too. Though I really like him. He seems like he's in the Aaron Jones, Tyler Irvin sort of mold. A little bit small, not necessarily too small. Fast, but not necessarily a blazer. The athletic outside zone type runner also has a kick return background. He can do a lot of the things the Packers tend to look for out of their running backs. He's a fairly good receiver too. If you get hung up on the size being only 203 pounds, I get that. I think it kind of works the other way too because you can look at guys that are the the classic, you know, 5'10", 5'11", 215, 220 pounds and just say that's a prototypical running back. Well, he can't play. That, that sword cuts both ways. So if you if you find a guy who's a little bit too small that plays well, don't knock him down just because of his size. And if you find a guy who is not productive but meets all the, the height, weight, speed requirements you have, that's great for you. Uh, but be forewarned that just because he has those characteristics doesn't mean he'll be good. Uh, you gotta got to be both. Moving right along, Kishon Vaughn out of Vanderbilt is another interesting prospect. 5'10", 214 pounds, one of the two guys – on our list without a relative athletic score above eight. And we'll finish with both of those two guys. A lot of people talk about him being a little bit tight, which would explain the low athletic score, but good straight line speed. He has a 103 speed score, which is pretty good. Not great, but good. Not a lot of big plays for him either. More of a grinded out style runner. Still had 50 50 plus catches. 66th, in fact, 10th most out of running backs who tested at the Combine. He reminds me more of the Devontae Mays type guy. He's not as big as Mays was, but uh, a thickly built, tightly wound, straight line sort of runner. And I think the Packers are probably trying to get away from that a little bit more. It seems that way, at least, uh, with with Jones and Irvin uh, getting more consideration. Finally, we'll finish out talking about Patrick Mays out of Memphis. Six foot one, two hundred seventeen pound prospect. He is ESPN's seventeenth ranked running back. He again is the second of two guys without a relative athletic score above eight. Pretty productive, good as a receiver. He scored a touchdown every thirteen carries as a senior. To me, he reminds me a little bit of James Starks, tall, straight line guy, a little stiff looking at times, but gets it done and. You can get by, I think, with a stiffer runner in a zone running scheme uh, more than than just about anywhere else. So um, I wouldn't necessarily knock Taylor down there. I feel like I'm going through these guys really fast, and there's a couple reasons for that. Again, all the stuff that we talked about up at the top, um, running backs are hard to project uh, because there's a lot of variables and, and you know testing matters. It doesn't always matter all that much. But also there's just a lot of them, and you can plug almost anybody in and find out if he works or not really quickly. So you take a guy, he works, he doesn't work, you move on. So if I'm drafting from among these guys, who do I take? I think it's got to be Cam Akers or Darrington Evans for me. I like that they hit everything that we looked at. Their size doesn't necessarily bother me. Bother me, And if size is an issue for you, you go with, with Akers. A little bit bigger, a little bit more thickly, thickly built than Evans. The question then is when do the backers look at taking a running back? And if I'm making that call, I think no earlier than the fourth round. Not that they couldn't use a good running back, but I think other needs are going to outweigh outweigh um, the desire to have another running back. And now with Irvin back, that relieves a little bit of pressure from having to, having to draft a running back anywhere near the first three rounds or so. So, if any of these guys are available in the fourth round or later, I think you take a flyer on them, see what they can do. If not, 
you don't worry about it and you move on, get another back next year because they are going to need backs sooner or later, especially with Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams heading into contract years. So running backs, there you go. What do you think? Let me know who you would take and uh, what you would like to see us talk about a little bit more. Note on that for a second. Uh, just today, just before we recorded, I was going back through a couple of the, the YouTube videos, looking at comments, following up on what people said. And I noticed that people tend to comment a little bit later than I've been um, giving them credit for. So usually I try to look at YouTube videos. I look at the, the video that posted to YouTube of the podcast, uh, the last one, the day I record the next one. So that's usually a gap of about two days. So I've noticed that people are tending to find the YouTube videos a little bit later than that. Most people who listen to the podcast or at least download the podcast do so on the first day or the second day. YouTube videos tend to have a little bit longer shelf life there. So if you're leaving comments and I'm not getting back to you there, I'm um, sorry about that. I will try to do a better job of circling back to some of the older videos there and trying to trying to find some stuff there. Because we have had people ask some questions I've noticed that I haven't gotten to and I don't want to think that want you to think that I am... Uh, just breezing over your questions there. And a couple of people asked for mock drafts. I think that's something that we can do, just kind of play out a couple of different scenarios, like say they draft a, a you know, a, a linebacker in the first round out of, out of who's available. Say they draft an offensive lineman in the first round out of who's available. Say they only pick from guys that we've talked about, who do they take? I think we could play out a couple of scenarios like that. The the thing that I wouldn't want to do is go like, I know you can, you can do these draft simulations where you go seven rounds deep. That it's fun. I think if you're super into mock drafts, I would really struggle with that because at a certain point, you're really getting out of the uh, the comfort zone or, or guys that you can really know all that much about. But but we can do something like that. That could be a lot of fun. Let's finish the the position by position preview first. So we have defensive backs and off the li- off the ball linebackers to go. Let's do that. Do both of those before we start diving into into mock draft stuff. So we will do some of the, that sort of stuff. Um, just not yet. I want to talk about all of the position groups first. Let's talk book club. So for this episode, I asked you to read the first chapter of Take Your Eye Off the Ball. And Mr. Kerwin starts out with something that I think is a really good skill for every football watcher to have. Charting plays. And he walks you through what to keep an eye on, other than the ball, obviously, on, uh, on each and every play. So different personnel groupings, things like that. Now, charting is something that I actually do as I watch games, but I do it a little bit differently than Pat Kerwin does. And I think the important thing to do when it comes to charting is to find a system that works for you. So looking at the personnel groupings like he recommends is a great way to go about it. Uh, But what I do is I just keep track of down and distance, uh, where the drive started, and how much time there was left on the clock when the drive started. So that's stuff that I can look back on when I'm going through my notes later in the, in the whether I'm doing a podcast or just want to refer back to it or, or whatever. That's stuff that I can look back on and have without having to look up the game book or, or the charting data on pro football reference or whatever. So I like to have uh, what drive number it was in addition to those, those other two things. I also keep track of down a distance for every play, and then just a rough sketch of what half happened on the play. So if you go to profootballreference.com and just pull up any Packers game, any random Packers game, you can you can look at the play-by-play data and see what happened in, in that game. So let's just pull up a game at random here. Well, I'm, I'm going to use an example from the Packers-Eagles game from week four last year. Um, you can just look at any play from that game and see what happened there. So the Packers' first drive here started with 1249 left in the first quarter. First didn't tend to go from the Packers' own 11-yard line. And the play-by-play data reads this. Aaron Rodgers' pass complete short left to Jamal Williams for no gain. gain. Tackle by Nigel Bradham. Penalty on Derek Barnett. Unnecessary roughness, 15 yards. I don't chart all of that information because I know that I can refer back to the actual play-by-play Um, later on if that's something that I need. What I do is write down uh, the player's number who got the ball in the play and and at least where they got got the ball. So my play-by-play data for the Packers' ninth drive uh, starts with first and 10, 80, middle. So that tells me that Jimmy Graham caught a short pass over the middle. And I chart other notes that um, 
that kind of occur to me as the plays go along. For instance, half a dozen plays later, the Packers have a second and six. Uh, I wrote 17 open, 12 slight underthrow. Um, the actual play-by-play data from that says second and six, Aaron Rodgers pass incomplete deep right intended for Devontae Adams. That's good to know, but it doesn't necessarily help you when I'm trying to refer back to that play. And I actually had a star next to that play in the margin because that was something that, that was a play that could have ended up uh, helping the Packers in a big way because they were actually down seven at this point and ended up losing by seven points. That was a play that the Packers could have ended up scoring on had the play been on target or at least gotten more yards. So that that's what I would encourage you to do. Just write down, if you want, the basic details about the play and stuff that is going to help you remember that play later on. I like his system for writing down the personnel groupings too. That's probably something that I should try to do as well because that tells you a little bit more about the play uh, than just writing down what happens. I also thought it was interesting that he made note of uh, made first downs versus inherited first downs. That's a good thing to be aware of. Uh, Inherited first downs are like uh, you force a punt and you start from your own 33-yard line first and 10. Well, that is an inherited first down. You didn't do anything to get that first down other than forcing them to punt. You got a first down just because it started on first down. Made first downs are, so you get the punt, uh, you get first and 10 on your own 33-yard line, you complete a 12-yard pass. It's first and 10 now from your own 45. That is a made first down. And the plays that you run on made first downs versus inherited first downs uh, are different. They are different in in one significant way. Drive starters, and this is something that we talked about a couple of years ago, not so much over this last season, but the 2018 season for sure. We did a good job of tracking drive starters. And drive starters are something that Aaron Rodgers talks about a lot. If you ever watch the NFL's Turning Point series on YouTube or NFL Films or whatever, um, he quite frequently makes mention of, of drive starters. So a play, a drive starter is just a play that you run that you know you can pick up a few yards on that gets you going on a drive. You start, you kind of settle into a drive that way. So the Packers quite often run a little boot action on first down, just a little dump off pass or an off tackle run. Something that's going to get you in the neighborhood of three to five yards, sets you up with the second and short and second and medium, just gets your drive started on the right footing. And that plays into that made first downs versus inherited first downs things. I really got a lot out of this first chapter. A nice little short chapter to get us started. We'll read chapter two for next week. Let me know what you think about chapter one of Take Your Eye Off the Ball. Uh, Let me know any thoughts that you might have about this uh, as we head into into chapter two. And we will bring them up as we talk about uh, the next chapter as well. That's all I've got for you in this episode. I do appreciate you reaching out, listening in, doing whatever you do to interact with the show. Uh, That makes this a lot more fun. As we're going through this time of social distancing, hearing from you guys uh, means a lot, and I appreciate you reaching out if that's what you're doing. Uh, If you have any ways or any thoughts about making the show better, there's something you want us to talk about, let us know wherever you happen to find the show, Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, wherever you do it, email, Patreon, all those great places. Let us know. We will try to follow up on your questions and concerns and thoughts and whatever. Uh, as they come in, because that helps this conversation continue. And that conversation helps us all become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.